afternoon. I'm uh, Kamel Jadidi, a professor of marketing and one of the founder of uh, EC Africa, our uh, program, what is called Enterprise Competitiveness in Africa. And uh, I'm delighted to open this event and welcome our special guest, Tony Elumelu, and his delegation from the Tony Elumelu Foundation. We are grateful for Tony to spend some time with us today, and, you know, and um, also thankful for the TEF, his foundation, to make this event possible. This event was, is organized by the Chazen Institute, uh, which I see as our bridge that connects us with global business leaders and policymakers, like events like this. We also thank the Lang Center for Entrepreneurship and uh, the Africa Business Club at the Business School for partnering with us to make this event happen. I would like to take uh, this moment to welcome our EC Africa participants who are here for a week to complete their 10-month training in, in business and management. They are here for a week to get some immersion experience at Columbia, in New York City, and present their continuous improvement project that they worked hard on it for the last 10 months. This program, we are proud of it because it is in line with Tony's philosophy of Afri-capitalism which basically say that if you want you know, to develop Africa socially and economically, you should invest in the private sector and entrepreneurs. Those are the key stakeholders in this task. So uh, the program basically stays 10 months, and as I said, we give them an executive MBA training for in this period, we, our students consult for them. Actually, we created a whole course called uh, the Africa Lab, and faculty are supposed to talk to them or consult for them for 18 hours, and they have like weekly coaches to get them to where they wanna get that, as was stated early on in the admission process. So, uh, we are happy to have you here, candidate of EC Africa, and good luck with your graduation on Friday. I want to say also that Africa is of greatest interest to our student body here. You know, uh, they are always present in events like this. They consult with um, African companies as part of the Pangea program. They travel to African countries to kind of uh, learn about the ecosystem and the business ecosystem there. They also run annual conferences called the Africa Economic Forum on a yearly basis, and this year it is the 18th time that is run. So, it's time to introduce our special guest. I'm honored to introduce Tony Elumelu. He's one of Africa leading investors and philanthropists. His accomplishments are quite extensive indeed. As a, no wonder why he was named as in the time 100 uh, by as the most, the, the most influential you know, uh, uh, people in the world and more recently as Time 100 Impact Awards. Please allow me to highlight just a few of his accomplishments. You could spend a whole day going over them. He's the founder and chairman of Hairs Holdings. It's a family investment company that is dedicated to improving lives and transforming Africa through long-term investment in strategic sector like power, energy, uh, healthcare, and technology. 
He's also the chairman of United Bank of Africa, a bank that he developed from scratch almost, based on my reading, to now the bank is having like 21 million or more than 21 million customers and is present in more than 20 countries in Africa and elsewhere in the world. Tony also chairs the largest quoted conglomerate called Transcorp. Two of its subsidiaries are Transcorp Power, which is the major or the leading uh, utility company in Nigeria, and Transcorp Hotels, which is the leading hospitality brand in Nigeria. In 2010, he created the Tony Alumilu Foundation with a, 10, one, with a $100 million commitment. Since inception, this foundation has done wonderful things. They had funded over 15,000 entrepreneurs and created the digital ecosystem of over 1 million Africans. Tommaso, uh, Professor Tommaso Porzio actually is working with the foundation to evaluate their impact on Africa. This fireside, uh, fireside chat uh, is, will be led by Ijoma Ijimadu. She's our first year MBA student at Columbia Business School. <laughs> Looking at her bio, I kind of see it as she's very passionate about entrepreneurship and helping entrepreneurs, especially women. The first thing she did, she created Ivory Ari to help African women with capacity building and make sure that they succeed as entrepreneurs. Prior to Colombia, she spent several months in Lagos where she explored the uh, growing tech and entrepreneurial ecosystem there. And she was useful to the founders by connecting them to talents as well as venture capital. She also worked at Uhuru Investment Partners, a West African PE firm. She developed their gender lens investment strategy and she was instrumental at attracting $20 million in funding from the IFC to kind of fund SMEs in Africa. She's a bright student, she's a Dream VC fellow, consortium fellow, and Forte fellow. She graduated with a chemical degree from a uh, and University with magna cum laude. Thank you all, and it's time for, uh, to welcome Tony Elmululu and his delegation to Columbia Business School. Thank you so much for the introductions um, and good afternoon, Mr. Tony. Um, we're so excited to have you here at CBS. Um, and uh, we are all excited to hear your thoughts on African development, especially when it comes to youth empowerment and um, entrepreneurship. But before we jump into that, I would love for you to share with us what your childhood was like and what was your first exposure to philanthropy? I'm very honored to be with you this afternoon in this uh, great uh, institution of uh, learning and development. And thanks, Prof, for your very kind and generous introduction and pleasure to be with you on stage. I said to her, it's like we plan to dress in uh, black. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so good to see you and uh, quite impressed with your accomplishments. Thank you. It is people like you on the continent that give us hope that the future of our continent will be bright and brighter than it is today. So first, my childhood, I come from a modest background. I was born and bred in Africa, food in Africa, started working in Africa, any bit of living or success in Africa. But uh, living in Africa, seeing uh, developmental uh, challenges, and where we are as a continent has driven the passion in me that we need more successful people on our continent, that we need to invest and prioritize our young ones, 
And so when you talk about uh, my first encounter of philanthropy, I would say it is my first uh, job, so to speak, because uh, that was a demonstration of what we do today, the fact that uh, the intercession of luck and uh, success. And so I was fortunate to work uh, under a leader who saw in me as a young person uh, some potential and opportunities uh, that I did not see. And that was what catalyzed and helped me to get to where I am today. So my philanthropy or the need or the, the, what drove the desire and aspiration to do what we're doing today started as far back as then. Because I kept telling myself, if this man did not give me the opportunity, I would not be who I am today, where I'm at today. And so what similar opportunities am I creating for others who are coming behind? And that was why and how it all started. At some point in my career, I thought it was not time to, to do that. And I call it, my colleagues and I would say it's democratization of luck. Time to democratize luck. Time to identify others who might have been, or I, in my situation as I was then, and giving such people the wing to fly, the opportunity to express themselves, you know, prove their concept, and start the journey of, uh, of uh, the, their life journey from, from that perspective. Thank you for that. Um, uh, one of the interviews, you'd mentioned a lot about um, entrepreneurship as a catalyst for economic development. And that's kind of what, you know, the Tony Lumelu Foundation is built around. Can you tell us about the moment you made the decision to start TEF? And then what were some of your challenges in understanding what the, what the um, gaps young African entrepreneurs actually faced? Okay, so let me go back so we'll contextualize it for, so for proper understanding. I started, as I said earlier, very early on in my career, in my, my life, and uh, I grew very fairly rapidly, and uh, I became CEO at a very young age, at the age of 34. And uh, at uh, 42, we orchestrated uh, the biggest uh, major to date in Sub-Saharan Africa of uh, the combination of United Bank for Africa and Standard Trust Bank, a bank we started from actually, so to speak, to a top level in the industry and brought UBA, which was the third largest bank in the country at the time, and Standard Trust Bank, fifth largest bank, together. And uh, in, at 47, I retired from active day-to-day -day banking CEO responsibility. And it was, what next? And I felt that uh, I should use the remaining part of my life for, to dedicate it to humanity, to, to help, to use, I use as the opportunity to start the democratization of luck. I thought it was time to, to help identify young Africans. In my career, looking at my own life and everything, I've come to realize that luck was so critical. Being at the right place at the right time and having access to mentors, having people who can help and hold you, when you make mistakes, correct you, people will give you the opportunity to make mistakes and prove your ideas, etc. And I wanted to do this at a scale that uh, would create the desired impact and also uh, help do that across Africa, not just in one country. And that was how we started the Tony Lumelu Foundation. That was the motivation for it. It was okay. The future one belongs to, of Africa belongs to our young ones. Two, if the jobs were in Africa, would they have succeeded? The other Steve jobs in Africa that we should identify, give opportunity, so that collectively we can all be involved in developing Africa. And then um, how? The 21st century. What, how do I want to be remembered? Is it by the money I have in my bank accounts or by the lives I'm able to touch and in a sustainable fashion so that the journey to developing Africa is not a journey undertaken by just a few people, but we democratize and make many people involved in that journey. So that was why my wife and I, we decided to endow the foundation with uh, 100 million US dollars so that will help 
to identify every year 1,000 young Africans, train them, 12 week training, give them um, appointment for them, and at the end of the training, give them $5,000 non refundable seed capital so that we can start the journey of building our own seed jobs out of Africa. Yes. Out of Africa. So that is the motivation, that is the purpose for the Tony Elmelu Foundation. Um, thank you for sharing that. And you are famously known for giving $5,000 checks. <laughs> no more. Um, <laughs> um, but I did want to understand what were some of the, what did you see was one of the things that African entrepreneurs struggled with the most through the training programs? No, no quite a lot of things. But first is, I say to people, capital is important, but not everything. You know, and you have, when you get capital, if you don't know how to use capital, you will not succeed. So training that 12-week uh, MBA is very important for the success of African entrepreneurs. Equally important is the appointment of mentors. People make mistakes. All of us have made mistakes in our careers before and our businesses. So you need somebody who has been there before to advise you, to tell you, no, no, this is it, and hold you, etc. But most importantly, and that ties into the philosophy of African capitalism, that intersection of doing well and doing good, that intersection of public and, and private uh, partnership, that creating the environment that enables young Africans to succeed. If the enabling environment is, if the environment is stifling and not enabling, even if you give a billion dollars to entrepreneurs, they will not succeed. In societies, environments, countries where entrepreneurs are in quote, like their own local government areas, meaning they have to generate their own power, they have to look for uh, storage facilities, uh, security, transportation, etc. The water, there's a limit to how much they can succeed. So that aspect, I think, is the most singular, most significant thing that must be fixed if we are committed and serious about the development of Africa through entrepreneurship. We must create the enabling environment that allow entrepreneurs to do it. So we preach that it's beyond our control for our engagement with governments, you know, advocacy, et cetera. And we, we, we stress that point. It's very, very, very important. So I would say that is even more important than capital. Um, and so you kind of alluded to this. So I personally spent last year in Lagos, um, again, learning about the tech and entrepreneurial community. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that running a business in Nigeria is very difficult. Um, so a lot of in Nigeria and many other African nations face issues of infrastructure and logistics and insecurity. And I guess, um, and you've kind of mentioned this, but I want to get your personal philosophy on what the role of private of the private and public sectors are um, within um, the African context? So first is, uh, let's have the public sector. Yeah. As I said earlier, government must provide the infrastructure, the enabling environment. Because if you have the right environment, even private capital will help to fix infrastructure deficits. So the issue is creating the enabling environment, government. And government must embrace the private sector as partners. You know, there's that suspicion between private and public that should go. Private government is good government supposed to create and by improve standard of living for its people. Private sector, we have now realized self enlightened interest. If people don't do well, you don't do well as private sector leaders. So there's a sink there. And I think the private sector, my viewpoint, they understand the point and they are moving in the right direction. But government needs to move faster or equally at same pace. Create the right environment, right policy regime, right macroeconomic environment so that private sector will blossom. And realizing that the success of private sector to a large extent is equal to the success of government. If private sector does not succeed, government doesn't succeed. Government per se don't create jobs. They don't have the capacity to create jobs. It is the private sector that creates jobs. So you must incentivize and encourage the private sector to succeed so that jobs can be created for your people. For the private sector, I also preach this to my contemporaries, friends, and, and peers that for too long we've condemned everything government, government, government. Those of us who are private sector and economy, we need to also stand up and do something. And what we do through the Tony El Melu Foundation is a demonstration of that, that it's not just about government, that we also can play our own part. And even our investment, which is again the heart of African capitalism, 
We make investments that help to catalyze economic prosperity. We we'll make invest in critical sectors that we need to drive development on the continent. Ac infrastructure, access to electricity. If we don't have improved access to electricity on the continent, there's a limit to how far we can go. As a if we don't invest in our young people, young entrepreneurs, so what we do to the new foundation is an investment in young Africans. And what we do when we invest in electricity is also trying to help create the right environment. So the private sector, we have a role to play. We need to, and we also like, when I come to America or engage with my friends outside of Africa, I tell them that in the 21st century, we have time-tested approach, approaches to development of Africa in a sustainable fashion. Come together, let's team up. There was a time uh, private sector leaders on the continent were just agents, agents and residents. So this changed. We have very strong, indigenous African private sector leaders. But our success should not be calibrated or measured by the profit we make or the money we have in our bank account. Our success should be measured by the money we have, the success we have or make of our business. But more important, or equally important, the lives we are able to touch so that in sync with government, with our development partners, multilateral agents, all of us can work together to power Africa to prosperity and, and have a new Africa where we give hope, economic hope and opportunities to our young people. We must realize and embrace the fact that to them is where the future of our continent lies. And if we are truly committed to developing Africa, it must start with uh, prioritizing our young ones, encouraging them, bringing our women into mainstream of economic activities, and then um, making sure that we hold our leaders accountable. Thank you for sharing that. And you mentioned a little bit about your friends and your peers that you um, chat with that are outside of Africa. And um, leads me to a question around partnerships. And um, on the back of an, a UNGA this year, your foundation just announced a $20 million foundation uh, partnership with the United States African Development Foundation. Um, congratulations to your team. Um, you. That is huge. <laughs> Um, so I guess, like, how have you managed um, these strategic partnerships and then how do they support your mission of empowering young Africans on the continent? First, uh, let me say that um, the partnership we signed with U USADF and, like, the one we also signed with the UNCDF, uh, they are not the first partnerships we've had. You know, we've even had a bigger one. But to us, what has happened this time is extremely symbolic. UNCDF is United Nations uh, Agency, and then USADF is US Agency. In the past, we've had uh, successful partnerships with UNDF, uh, UNDP, with the uh, European Union, with um, the ICRC, et cetera. But this is the first time we're breaking into America because it, to us, it's very critical, very important that the relationship between the West and Africa should, in the 21st century, be reimagined, redefined. And, and the, the, the way of uh, the nature of the partnership or relationship before um, should change. You know, aid is good, but in the 21st century, aid should be more catalytic for it to be sustainable and for it to create the desired impact. We don't want to have people who are who be beggars forever. We don't want to want to, we don't want to have people who depend on hand forever. We want to create self-reliance and independence. And that is what we preach at Tinel Mill Family. And that is the kind of financial we are finding now to say, listen, let's come together. Let's 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 have a strong coalition for the development of Africa through entrepreneurship. Because it's time tested. We, we know how we've done it several times since 2010. And we can see the progress. We can see over 400,000 jobs created. We can see the, the, the significant the revenue improvement by these entrepreneurs who pay revenue to their countries. So in terms of employment, in terms of revenue generation, in terms of even being self-reliant on their own. And the people who give you $5,000 non-refund, those that succeed, they don't come back again. If anything, they want to scale to the next level, so they need different level of capital. 
So that is the nature of the partnership with Bridge. We're happy that the U.S. is embracing it. And so it's significant, not just because of the money. $20 million is huge, but not quite. We've had, we've done bigger things. But just that it's the beginning of um, greater things to come. And again, uh, signaling to the rest of the world, and especially our friends in this part of the world, that there's a new way to give in Africa that creates uh, self-reliance, and that we have boots on ground. Those who are test, uh, time-tested approaches to the new way, and that there's time to partner with us so that we can all make a difference. And by the way, we don't even say it must be the Tony Miller Foundation alone. No. Whoever. But what we're saying is, let us redefine the way we have assist. If we want to assist, let's engage in a different way, a way that must help us ensure that the beneficiaries today will not remain beneficiaries in 10 years' time. We want them to be independent and to also help create more opportunities for them. I am curious with um, the partnerships and how you've been navigating them. What have been like the biggest challenges um, since you, it sounds like the one that we're having now with the U.S. is such a big um, uh, a historic moment. Um, can you speak on some of the challenges with building partnerships with international organizations? No, the key, part, the key challenge is um, getting people to understand change in approach. I don't think, I wouldn't call it a, a challenge per se, but it's like a paradigm shift. When you're moving in that fashion, it takes a bit of time for people to understand. And that is why we're happy that people are embracing it gradually. That, you know, if you're used to every year budget, $1 million, $100 million for Africa, you have international consultants who take half of that, and what gets to the last mile is even less than 30%. It's a whole industry. It takes time to change because we're not seeing a new team that's saying, guys, no, no, forget it. We are in Africa. We know our ways around Africa. We know what the requirements are in Africa. We know how to calculate, measure the impact in a way that aligns with our people's aspirations for a better living. Come to us. And maximum, maybe 5 to 8, 9, 10% is what's the loss in the administrative processes. And so 90% gets to the end desired beneficiaries and not like 30% because of the slew of, uh, of uh, the ecosystem of international uh, consultants who feed up this. It's, it requires, it doesn't come so fast. It takes time. But the truth is, there's progress. People are listening. And again, I want to commend key early adopters like um, the United Nations Development Program. My good friend Akim is wonderful. You know, he, he, he caught this, got it very quickly. ICRC, they were the first partners. International Red Cross, first partners. Then, of course, European Union came big. You know, last year, the European Union supported 3,600 young African women ahead of. So the world is listening. This is a new intervention, a new way of developing Africa. That's what we preach. That's the, uh, this, uh, the, the our commitment to our people, a practical demonstration of the fact that we know from experience, from our own life story, <laughs> that I know today in our group, we have over 30,000 people in our employment across Africa who pay taxes. And we do look at the fallout, what we do at the Tunnel Relief Foundation. The money is from the profit that we make. So we have seen what one person, a successful entrepreneur in Africa, can do. So let's, we need millions, a continent of 1.3 billion people. We need to have some, like, let's even say 10 million very successful. The continent will change. So entrepreneurship is to us one of the time-tested ways of developing the economy. And the more we get people to invest in entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs on the continent, and the more those young entrepreneurs don't disappoint us by succeeding, 
uh, they better will be the future of our country. Yeah. Agreed, agreed. Um, um, you, you've invested a lot in entrepreneurial community, obviously through your TEF. I'm curious what sectors you're excited about, what industries, what verticals are you most excited about now? We're sector agnostic as a foundation, but we do have partners who are interested in specific areas. The green economy, technology, women, uh, fashion, creative sector. So, but for us as a foundation, we're sector agnostic. We just leave it open because you never can tell. You know, today the world has embraced technology. When Steve Jobs started, I keep going back to that, to that great man, <laughs> because when he started, I mean, all, I mean, let's even look at Google or Facebook. Seemingly casual things, but it's changed the world today. You know, even Zoom, <laughs> you talk to communication. So you never can tell. The best thing just to us, the development of Africa, we just want our young, talented Africans who are energetic, ambitious, intelligent, who want to succeed, who want to get the opportunity in any sector. Okay, so you're passionate about all sectors. Um, this is um, gonna be our final question. So those who have questions in the audience will be coming to you soon. Um, but so, so many of us here have actually had the opportunity to leave the continent um, to pursue our personal and professional goals at Columbia. What do you think our role is as Africans in diaspora in making sure that youth empowerment and economic development is progressing? And for those who are enthusiastic about the opportunities in Africa, how, they, how can they participate as well? I, I like this question, you know, because most times Africans in diaspora at times, we don't see ourselves as Africans again. And I just under don't understand why people want not to identify with their origin and their root. I say to my children, one is schooling in the US here, one is in the UK. And I say to them, you know you're Nigerians? Huh? You know you're Africans? <laughs> so yeah, that's the window. I say, I need to drum it in your head. So don't go there and say, originally I was from. So you know you're from. <laughs> <laughs> you who you are Africans, uh, that's number one. Why do I say this? I think you all in diaspora have a strong voice. You can hold our leadership accountable. There's lack of accountability on the continent. I want you guys, let's hold our leadership accountable, let them, so that they change, you know. They, I, I, do, I want to see positive change in that. That to me is number one. Number two is, also remember that this South African music, yeah. what, where, whereby you are, don't forget the root or where you from, <laughs> what to be there. So let's remember that we're Africans and let's, in our own way, knowledge sharing, volunteering, whatever it is, let everybody be involved in making sure that we, we, we lift Africa out of poverty. No one but us in the 21st century will develop Africa. So realizing of that is very critical. And I want our young ones who are that's why who's seeking, of course, for understandably, either education or good jobs, just remember where you come from and see how you can be involved in, in, in both civil society, anything. So accountability is critical. Accountability makes the difference in life. So if there's one word on the living, yes, it is that uh, we should hold our leaders accountable and personally, I'd like to see your success, because your success is also success for Africa. You know, when I see young Africans who have succeeded, it gives me excitement. I'm very happy to see that, because well, first, it helps to, to, to point, shine light on Africa in the positive sense. And two, it helps to encourage and inspire others to say, this person is this, you know, from this background, this modest style. I will aspire to be at that same level even more. So your role models for Africa. So hold that role very well. Thank you. Um, are there any questions in the audience? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm right here. Okay. okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. They made, they made me focus on just this. Let me turn <laughs> to this now. 
and I've been really excited to see you here because um, I'm from EC Africa, um, the train with EC Africa, and um, in 2015, I was um, part of the first set of people funded by Sonia and Melu Foundation. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> Stand up, let me see you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow, you are the 2015 set. 2015 eh? set, yes. What do you do now? Anyway, go on. What do you do now? Yes. <laughs> so I run um, an agri-tech company for farmers. We run an e-commerce site like Amazon. Wow. But our customers are farmers, and wow. the products that we have are agricultural products like wow. planters, harvesters, pesticides, and chemicals. We deliver those things to farmers across Nigeria, but we are busy in the battle. You know, I can proudly say that. Um, $5,000 was sponsored, was given to us in 2015. Today, that is less than our monthly salary. Wow. Oh. And that's without external investment so far. We've just been multiplying what was given to us five years ago. Right now, we have, we pay about um, 50 staff. And we you have staff, 50 staff now? 50 staff now, that's yes. It. And we serve tens of thousands of farmers across Nigeria. Wow. That's just, just really very grateful. Thank you very much for your support. Mm. I'm very excited to see you. Very excited. So two things. I have a point of curiosity first. Amongst the people that have been funded by the foundation, which um, sector would you say has performed better? over the last couple of years? Is it agriculture, is it fashion, is it tech? Which one has performed better based on return on investment? That's one. Then my question is, um, for us now that have gone through the foundation many years ago, how do you want us to engage with the foundation going forward? What part do you want, to, do you want us to play? Wow. And then what, how do you want us to engage with you going All forward? All right. So first is, uh, I want to, your name? My name is Ayo Oyudotu. Ayo, I want to congratulate you. Thank you. And I want to say how very proud of you I am. For me, this is one of those moments. Like people ask me, a surprise didn't ask because it was implied. People ask, why are you doing this? You know, why I'm doing this, this, your story, what you just shared here, is the motivation. To see, I mean, 50 people in your employment, and look at all the things, if that direct employment, the 10,000 farmers across Nigeria that you're supporting. I mean, if we could do more of this, let's just, if we, Nigeria is a 200 million people country, if we could have like 1 million like this, you change the face of that country. 1 million like this, 1 million 50 times, that's 50 million jobs. Things will change. And this is what I say to people. What, there's no greater satisfaction than what just happened here. So I wish you success, and we should we'll continue to stay in touch. Your first question, I think all, most sectors, but I think agriculture has done very, 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 very well. Across Africa, agriculture has done very well. Technology has also done well, but I think agriculture should be the highest. Both in Nigeria, East Africa, Uganda, almost everywhere, agriculture. And it actually goes to portray the fact that agriculture is the mainstay of our economy. And if we want to fix employment, unemployment situation in Africa, we must prioritize that sector too. Very, very important. And uh, to your last question, very humbling. And uh, by the way, thanks for succeeding, because some don't also succeed. <laughs> <laughs> So your last question, I, we will note it, but we have, um, we've done 12 years now, so we have um, a strategy session coming up uh, on the 7th to 10th of October in Abuja. I want to reimagine just the next 10 years for the Tunnel Milu Foundation. Uh, it would be nice if you're in Nigeria, I've been in Nigeria, for you to give us a talk on your, your expectations, uh, expectations, and the question you asked, now, I will ask that question to you, that how do you want the beneficiaries of uh, the Tinu Nilu Foundation to engage with the foundation, you know, in propagating further and doing what the foundation stands for? So I would, I would like, if you are, my people will get in touch with you, 
But standing here, what I think you need to do, we would like you to do is we want to like mentors. We'd like someone like to be, you'll be a great mentor to others. So it would be nice to enroll or else enlist you as a mentor to others. You know, I mean they will learn a lot from you. One, you pass through the foundation and two, you're succeeding in your area. So that'd be wonderful, wonderful. And um I think, I think to me that would be a big thing, but my people might have other ideas. So they will get in touch with you and let's interact more, uh, and especially have you join us at the session. Even if you're not in the country, you can join us virtually and give us a 30-minute talk on what you think uh, we should do more, how areas for improvement for the foundation. That would be appreciated. Well done, Ayo. Congratulations. Yes. Oh. Um, my name is Felicia Malongo. I am. Uh, Who? Felicia. Okay. Malongo. I just graduated with my Master of Public Administration from Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, and uh, I, f for my Masters, I did a thesis on the Renaissance and cultural uh, awakening in Africa as a way to develop the economy, as a way to impact the youth, knowing that um, Africa has a high percentage of individuals under the age of 25. I thought that culture and Renaissance, in parallel to the Italian Renaissance, would be a good way to boost. Sorry, I can't hear you very, very well. Yeah. In parallel to the Italian Renaissance, we'd be able to boost um, the economy. So I had a question for you because I thought that um, your input or any investors like you would be fundamental for the movement. And my question is, how do you encourage large foundation and investors like yourself to create portfolios that include this? Nigeria is an example, but how can we do it across Africa? <laughs> I think uh, you're speaking to an apostle of this. <laughs> so first is uh, wear my business hat. We operate in 20 African countries. That business. So we don't just operate in Nigeria alone. And then uh, wearing my philanthropy hat, we operate in all 54 African countries. We have beneficiaries across Africa. Every country, Seychelles, you know, all the small, tiny countries in Africa, they all have, they all have their beneficiaries. So I believe so much that uh, in the 21st century, we should have no boundaries to, to business. You know. And the AFCTA, the AFCTA, the coordinated fee trade uh, arrangement also helps us, should help us to foster business integration, expansion across, across, across Africa. Even though we still have some challenges. But you know, again, this is where I say the private sector, if you have vibrant private sector on the continent, we'll work together to even bring down the, 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 the barriers. Because if I have issues that affect my business, and I do have in some areas, I would engage with the policy makers, and chances are they would listen to me. And as they remove those obstacles, I won't be the only beneficiary. It will also rub off on others. And I, you have people who produce different products like cement in Africa to move cement to the next country is a problem, and everyone working together to make sure that Customs, uh, custom policies are harmonized across regions or regional economies. It helps everyone, not just that person, that company alone. It helps all of us. Uh, in our own area, so many things we've done at business area. Some countries that uh, visa was an issue to grant, we put pressure, and some started giving visa on arrival at the airport okay, to Africans. And we said to leaders, if we don't have freedom of movement, of people, good movement of goods, and payment simplification across the continent. How do we integrate you know, as a continent? So there are, our leaders are gradually beginning to listen. So how do you encourage that, if my question is right, is first, we need to lead by example. 
We need to show. We need to invest. Uh, leaders should, private sector leaders, where opportunities exist. Where, for us, if you grow scale, uh, it's best you level your scale across geographies. So we need private sector to succeed to, for that to happen. Our leaders should embrace and support, support them, harmonize policies so that we just want Africa to develop. You know, and in Africa, business is very important to that development. So if I heard you very well, that is the, is the, is the, is the answer. Did that address, is that what you were asking? Yes, it, it did partially address it, but I think um, also in my thesis, it was about the renaissance of Africa using art and culture. The renaissance of Africa. Yes, using art and culture to create a positive identity. Okay, using art and culture. No, no. I, yes. Anyway, so I think uh, yes, yes, today, a lady entered my room, uh, the, the house, uh, housekeeper, came into my room this morning. I was playing music when I exercised. I play, <laughs> I play, I'm, I'm a piano, I'm a piano, Afro, Afro So I was playing and the lady started just nodding. Ah, I said, what, well, do you know this song? I was playing one of these, uh, I think I was playing, uh, I play harmonize, you can, harmonize, <laughs> So the lady said, I said, you know, she said, yeah, that she knows the song. I said, you listen to the African song? She said, yes. And I said, uh, and she went to, she said, uh, there are some African ladies who work in this hotel, who work in this hotel, they only begin not to dance to it. So, you see, at some level, <laughs> culture, music, entertainment, lifestyle, all those things bring us together. And you don't even know where the person is from, whether they're from Nigeria or Togo, etc. Everyone sees them. The truth is, business, to a large extent, business, music, art, culture, entertainment, they all help to bring Africa, Africa, Africa together. And we all have a role to play. Plus, I believe you heard when I talked about my children, I said that you, everyone should be proud also of their heritage, proud of who they are, proud of where they come from. And we do have, the glasses are full, we do have our challenges. You know, you see people embarrass the continent, but you also see good people who do great things. So let's, and listen, I always say, when people say to me in some countries, you know, that they have uh, criminals, I say, wait, wait, you have a country of 200 million people, not that it's tolerable, and a thousand people behave in a bad way. How do you now use that to just generalize that everyone is bad? I carry a green passport, a Nigerian green passport, and proudly so too. And I hold my head high everywhere because I'm Nigerian born bred there. And there's nothing my friends from any other part of the world can do that I don't think I can do, or where they will stand I cannot. So the fact that we have challenges does so not mean that all of us should be painted in that same light. Growing up and reading Guinness Book of Records, those days they used to say that in New York, every four minutes or four seconds, someone is assassinated. Those days, does that make New York an unsafe place for us to visit and, be, and, and enjoy ourselves? We do have challenges. So let's be also proud of our heritage, proud of who we are. And collectively, we can change the narrative, change the characterization and get our people to do the right thing, because they too must do the right thing, so that we'll have a better society. Thank you. Um, I think we have room for one more question. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon. Play, plus maybe another lady, so we'll balance. Oh, yes. <laughs> then the other lady wants to, uh, okay, she's okay. there, so <laughs> one. <laughs> there. Okay. Yes, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to Columbia Business School. Uh, my name is Owen Odige. Um, Your name is who? Owen Odige. Owen. Uh -huh. Um, and so I'm a third year, I'm a dual degree student at the business school and the public policy school. Um, last year I served as the student body president here. And this year I'm one of the co-chairs for the Columbia Africa conference. Um, and so just a quick plug, October 20th to 29th, we'd love to have you, please come. Um, but you know, and just one shout out, I know you, uh, I believe you grew up in Edo state. My family's at Edo as well, grew up in Benin city. So just really proud to see somebody from you know, the Edo State area, 
Delta State area coming out and doing great things. So thank you. Um, it's, it's, it's our way here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think my question, speak this, right? <laughs> uh, my, my quick question was kind of what we talked or, you know, kind of what you guys talked about is just, I think, you know, in this room, there's a lot of, you know, sons of, you know, African parents or African immigrants, right? And like now we've really all kind of either based a life here in the UK or the USA. How do we really optimize having access to both um, both worlds and really thinking about what we can do as like kind of this future generation now? Because, you know, like many people here, like my my parents live in Nigeria now, but I have spent almost my entire Why life. Are you Nigerian? Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm not Nigeria. originally. You're Nigerian. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but I, I just think, like, I think a big thing that we all try to think about is how do we really bridge these worlds together and optimize? Because, like, right now we're in New York, and culturally, Afrobeats is massive here in New York. Like, it is runs most of the nightlife. My room today. Yeah. Um, but how do we then think about it past culture, right? How do we start thinking about it? economically and really creating ways that we can actually significantly create economic growth here and back home, um, whether that's Nigeria, Ghana, or whatever other country we're from. So that's kind no, of- but I must say that uh, you asked a question, also you like a long question, but I think this is a good moment for Africa, you know, to hear young Africans very appear excited and uh, eager to contribute to the economic development of the continent. That's very, very good. I, as I said to her, for, for, for you guys first, I'd like everyone to be successful in what they do. You know, because the development of Africa is not just material. Even in terms of characterization, mindset, perception. Perception has brand equity. If people see a continent, a continent is good, has a lot of people, people are succeeding, people are good, and that, their propensity to invest in that kind of environment will be high. So if you succeed, all, not you, if all, all Africans in diaspora success, good example, be disciplined, and then holding, again, leaders accountable on the continent. You know, today they say the pen is mightier than the salt. So you're here, but we live in a global village. It's digitalized. Everyone, we're all linked one way or the other. What happens in New York? Well, I'm here. I'm sure people in Nigeria are watching what's going on here. So we need to have a strong voice. Let's hold our leaders accountable. But first, let's seek equity with clean hands. Let us on our own be successful in everything, anything, not just financial success, anything, academic success, everything we do. Let's show good, good examples, such seemingly little but quite significant ways will help in helping to, to change the narrative, helping to develop our continent. And then you become role models. The younger ones in Africa will see you the way you're succeeding. If you hear Amina Mohammed today, Ngozo Konje Wala today, you know, people like are inspired by these great ladies of African descent that or if they got, okay, there's hope that we too can get there. So we need such, uh, such inspiration to also come. They say it's a way to, of succeeding, of developing, uh, playing your own role in developing the continent. Uh, hi, I almost forgot my question. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Toke. I'm a first year student. Um, and prior to this, I was working at Dalberg Advisors. So Dalberg. Yeah, Dalberg. So I mean, obviously, we're working with um, different multilateral institutions to come up with sustainable solutions and like on different critical issues. So specifically, youth unemployment. So um, as you were speaking, I was trying to formulate the question in my head. So I hope this is clear. Um, so how? in your place of power and position, how would you advise maybe young entrepreneurs in Africa, Nigeria, everywhere in Africa, actually, not just Nigeria, um, to come up with solutions that 
empower Nigeria or their country, whether it's Ghana or anywhere else in Africa, and then make that solution global so that it's not just restricted to the uh, populace in Africa who may not be able to afford like specific solutions that they render? I think uh, it's a val valid question, but uh, I believe in certain philosophies I would like to share here. One is what they call baby steps. Taking things one, facing yourself one step at a time. I believe in it. Two is, I believe that the journey of a mile starts with one step. Okay? In my business uh, career, when we took over a distressed bank, you know, when we started Standard Trust in 1997, we wanted to conquer the world, but we knew we needed to grow in phases. So we came up with what we call the three-tier strategic intent. First tier strategic intent, we put time frame and milestone. Second tier strategic intent, we put time frame and milestone. And third tier strategic intent, we put time frame, milestone. So as we accomplish first, it encouraged us to move to the second one. Okay, and as we accomplish the second, encourage us to also move to the third, and we put time frame. We said, in 10 years, I want to be one of the top, 10, three, uh, top three banks in Nigeria. Second tier in 10 was, I want to be one of the top 10 banks, year seven. And the, the first tier trade in 10 was, I want to be a viable bank, because it was distress first. So we said we'd have achieved that viability, we move to the next one, and move to the third one. And by year eight or eight and a half, we had accomplished the three tiers of the intent. But if we started by saying we want to be this without those intents or those uh, milestones and time frame, we wouldn't have. So my advice for entrepreneurs is I am a strong believer of start small and grow big. So the entrepreneur that wants to serve Africa, start first from where you are and do it, master it, and, and scale. Today, United Bank for Africa operates in 20 African countries, but we started in Nigeria. We started as a distressed bank. Today, United Bank for Africa operates in Paris, London, Dubai, and is the only African bank that is a deposit taking bank in all of United States of America, with a regulator by a federal uh, regulation. So we did not start the one that want to do it. We started one step, two step. So my advice to young African entrepreneurs, start small, acquire the expertise, make mistakes. We made a lot of mistakes. If we're on a global scale, a uh, sin, when we started with the mistake, we'd have been out today. So start small, make mistakes, learn from it, and fortify, and move on. So. They can, but let them keep that story, that that audacity, that that desire, that ambition alive, for realizing that they need to start small and gradually move up to that that level. And yes, I think that we should. African entrepreneurs should see all of Africa as their market, and not just a geographical confined uh, location like Nigeria, Ghana, etc. All of Africa. But let them know that they have to start small and scale up. So they can say first in Ghana, you know, then later in the sub region, sub region, and third maybe all of Africa. And when they get there, they re-strategize. So when we finish as we remember our third tier strategy in ten, which was like the biggest then to us was to be one of the top three banks in Nigeria. When we got there in 2005, we had to recalibrate. So what next? So we decided again, lead in Nigeria, be uh, one of the leading banks in Africa, and have global presence. So that global presence, we're in New York, we're in London, we're in Paris, we're in Dubai, global presence. Uh, lead in Africa, operation in 20 African countries, with over 36 million customers across Africa, and over 1,000 branches across Africa. Lead in Nigeria, of course, in the bag. So those are... But remember, in all of these things, one step first, 
factors. Because at times, when you think too big from the onset, you, you, you might be discouraged. <laughs> you might be discouraged. Thank you. Um, do you have time for? OK, we can take one and two. That, that's a lady, right? Yes. And then here, yeah, we take these two, then we can move. Sorry. Okay. Sounds good. Two. Hi, um, thank you so much, Mr. Tony. It's good to meet you here. My name is Shakirat. Um, I've spent the last four years in the Nigerian investment banking space. In fact, I worked at one of your subsidiary firms, United Capital, right after college. Um, <laughs> I've been living in Nigeria all my life, and I just came here for my MBA at Columbia last August. I'm a first year student. Yeah. So one of the things I'm looking to do with my career is to provide solutions for small and medium scale enterprises across Africa. I know you have um, footprint across Africa. You've, you're more familiar with the regulatory landscape there for the banking space. So what advice would you give me on navigating the regulatory landscape across different African countries, you know, starting from Nigeria, which has a very, very interesting regulatory space in the banking space, I'm sure as you know. So what advice would you give me to get started on that? I think the advice I would give is, uh when you're in a regulated business, you know, having um, compliance becomes extremely important. And so I'll tell you briefly, when we started, you know, it was, uh, you have to engage with regulators and share your aspirations, share your journey, what you want to accomplish. That. Regulators can be very skeptical, so please understand that. I remember when we wrote first time to a central bank about our intent to take away this bank. The then director of first he wrote, Bogus, <laughs> this bogus, uh, some bogus claim or bogus uh, ignore, but we kept in, engaging. So don't be deterred, okay? If you know what you want to accomplish, engage and engage and engage. For greatly, they will listen to you. And then, but for me, I've seen that regulators, regulators want operators to come in. That's why they are against monopoly. But I think that they would want operator who will not rock the sector. So if you engage with a regulator and let them know what you want to achieve, in the long run, they will listen to you. Sorry, I'm being brief because I think that's the last. Uh, OK. Um, hi, my name is Patrick Beckley. I'm an environmental engineer at the Columbia Climate School. And I'm from Freetown, Sierra Leone. Um, I was also a participant in the TEF um, program this year. Um, so ah, you're a participant. <laughs> yeah, I, I was uh, in the fall. So um, I really appreciate that opportunity. Um, one thing that I did notice about the program was how well you were able to connect us digitally and just seeing um, other entrepreneurs from other parts of Africa and in the diaspora like digital. But I would say one of the biggest issues as, a, as an African entrepreneur is logistics, the physical component of like actually being able to connect um, back in Freetown or in other places in other parts of the continent. So um, what were, are some of the challenges that you've had to overcome logistically with, with your own business um, um, initiatives? And are you, is that a space that you're looking at? Like, or could we expect like a TEF flight service or, you know, a plane in the future? Um, I would love to hear your comments about that. Uh, well, good to meet you and uh, good luck on your entrepreneurship journey. I think uh, we do have a lot of uh, infrastructure and national voice and rigidities on the continent. And uh, talking about what government should do, helping us to alleviate such rigidities will uh, orchestrate and drive growth on the continent, will help people like you and others here to succeed as entrepreneurs. So we, it's a challenge for all of us. And something we preach, and beyond preaching, something we do. So in our group, uh, we have Transco, Transnational Corporation of Nigeria. Transco has the highest electric generating capacity in Nigeria, 2,000 megawatts. But we do about 600, 700 megawatts now because of gas limitation, which we're also trying to overcome. That investment is good for profitability, but more importantly, it also helps to address the single chronic most vast biggest problem that's affecting Africa development, that is access to electricity. So we try to highlight some of these things, but in addition to highlighting, we also try to do something to show. And the good thing is the world is listening. 
People also want to identify or support Africa in the area of this logistics infrastructure, etc. Transportation to fly from uh, Lagos to to Frita or that place can be stifling, very difficult. And how can you develop a continent? How can you encourage in trafficker business or trade if our people cannot move across borders easily? So those are challenges we need to overcome. And those are things uh, we, we talk to our partners and friends of Africa that there are opportunities here, opportunities there. You can look at this. Africa is big, and you can make the kind of returns on investment that you don't make elsewhere. So that's why my appeal to everyone, we should create the right, the right reputation, image for Africa, so people would like to come to invest in Africa. A situation where our young ones come back home to work in Africa, and due to insecurity or difficult uh, hostile operating environment, they go back. It's not good. When they go back, it leaves bad taste, and, and they don't, it doesn't encourage. So there's a lot for us to do as private sector leaders, a lot to do as public sector leaders to make sure we attract the right investment and create the right environment for our people to succeed. Um, thank you all for your questions, and thank you. Um, uh, to continue the conversation, for those who did not get the opportunity to um, get their questions asked, we do have the 19th annual Columbia Africa Business Conference. Um, that's going to be October 28th and 29th. So feel free to keep an eye out for that. Again, it's next month, the 28th and the 29th. Um, and thank you today uh, for for actually being here and actually answering our questions today and talking a little bit more about African development. Thank you, Jama. Thank you. Good to meet you.